So we're joined with Mariana Spring today and she's a disinformation specialist at the BBC as I'm sure most people have joined will know. Um, so if you could start by just introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your role, that's okay. Um, so I'm Mariana, um, I am the BBC's first ever specialist uh, disinformation and social media reporter uh, which means that I investigate viral conspiracy theories, um, disinformation circulating online and the real world impact that they have. So I often look at how they've destroyed relationships uh, or resulted in real world harm. Uh, that's often been about the pandemic recently uh, and most recently about the coronavirus vaccine. Um, but more broadly, uh, I've also covered the US election. And whenever there's a big breaking news event, we tend to see lots of disinformation circulating online. Uh, and it's always important to point out that um, there's a big difference between legitimate concerns, government criticisms, um, questions about policy, um, criticism of lockdown for economic reasons, excess deaths, mental health, and then these very outlandish conspiracy theories that are totally unsubstantiated and that are spreading all over the internet. So obviously there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there, especially now. Um, how do you, you and the rest of your team kind of come to the bottom of a conspiracy theory? What process do you go through? So there are different facets to what our team does. I'm really lucky to work with a brilliant team of experts at the BBC and also some really great editors. Um, and we do a variety of different things. Uh, there's straightforward fact checking, uh, which our reality check team do a lot of and straightforward is doing them a disservice because it's not very straightforward usually. Um, but that will involve, you know, fact checking whether something's true or not, um, getting to the bottom of it and then doing a fact check. Uh, the team at BBC Monitoring do a lot of kind of analysing how viral something has gone and monitoring where it's spread in what languages and that can help us to see whether something is viral enough that we need to address or investigate it. Um, and then I tend to spend a lot of time um, investigating uh, particular stories and humanizing the cost and impact of viral disinformation. So a good example would be a story I worked on um, a couple of weeks ago, which was called uh, My Foot Became Anti-Vax Propaganda. I did that for TV, radio uh, and online. And basically I got to the bottom of these pictures of these rather gruesome looking feet that were going viral in anti-vax circles and spilling into parent groups. Um, and the reason we decided to cover that story is because these feet were popping up again and again, and we wanted to get the, to the bottom of what was happening. We wanted to see if it was was indeed related to the vaccine or in this case it wasn't as the lady perceived the placebo um, and it was a really I often think that it's there's so much for us to cover at the moment there are so many conspiracy theories from QAnon which is this baseless conspiracy that suggests President Trump is waging a secret war against satanic paedophiles to the idea that a vaccine will uh, be used to inject a microchip to uh, you know everything in between about coronavirus and so sometimes we find it more effective to do quick debunks in the short term but to focus on specific case studies that are emblematic of what's going on like the foot story which is emblematic of how anti-vax disinformation spreads online and how particular stories can be misused to fuel conspiracies on social media because if we tried to cover everything i would get no sleep although i already don't <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine it's definitely a very consuming job, especially now. Um, so these conspiracy theories, they do have quite a big following from people. I think it's quite obvious that when somebody is taken in by a conspiracy theory, it's quite difficult to take them away from that. So how do you, I mean, personally and as a team, get someone to understand the actual truth behind these fake news stories? It can be really, really hard, particularly if someone is quite far down the conspiracy rabbit hole, because it doesn't matter what factual evidence you show, uh, they don't trust the BBC or they don't trust the media in general, or um, they are so fixed on their beliefs and they have a whole arsenal of evidence to uh, so-called evidence to substantiate what they're saying, even if a lot of it is untrue or has been discredited, discredited or has been cherry-picked. And I think it's for that reason that fact-checking, while it's really brilliant and important, alone is just not enough. And it's really crucial to understand why people turn to conspiracy theories. So I've got a uh, an article out today, which is how you can talk to your relatives about conspiracies over Christmas. Um, and that's got lots of tips from psychologists and people who used to believe conspiracies. And, and it's so much more than just giving them the facts. It's actually understanding why they believe it, it. Um, it's actually kind of getting to the bottom of legitimate concerns and differentiating them from conspiracies. Um, and then I think the most effective way is to, to you know, 
put human faces on, on, on these stories to show how different people's lives are affected, whether it's by abuse, whether it's, um, there was a man I interviewed who lives in Florida and uh, he believed coronavirus was a hoax because of stuff he saw on Facebook. He and his wife didn't follow health guidance and really, really sadly, uh, they both became very ill with coronavirus and his wife eventually died from complications linked to it. So being able to tell that story, just that one single story, I think is a really powerful way of reaching those, particularly when it involves someone that used to believe conspiracies. We often find that's really effective. It's kind of similar to uh, radicalization, religious radicalization, or political radicalization and if people hear from someone who wants to believe this stuff has experienced negative consequences and now realizes it's untrue that can be really helpful as well and I think the final thing that's really effective is to weaponize what allows disinformation and conspiracies to thrive online you know people like it because it's more exciting than the truth often uh, they like it because they kind of feel like they're in control that they can research stuff themselves weaponize that show our workings with our reporting show you know tell exciting stories of people whose lives have been impacted or not always exciting sometimes very sad but at least you know gripping and interesting and i think that's the best way of covering this beat just before i move on with my questions i just want to remind anyone who has joined this call that you can ask questions um, in the q a box as well um, and those questions are going to be answered in the second half i don't think i um, introduce this call with that so um, please do ask questions down below um so okay where am i at? <laughs> um okay this is kind of a bit topical um with the piece that you've written recently um but how do you deal with any online hate that you might get from the stuff that you publish um especially from people who maybe are taken in by these conspiracies and no matter how much you publish don't believe what you're saying yeah, I, I am. Uh, so I, I wrote this piece that was in the eye at the end of last week, um, which is all about this, um, basically because uh, I, I mean, journalists all over the world, including lots of my colleagues at the BBC, receive horrific abuse, whether it's homophobic, racist, misogynistic, or they work in countries where, you know, they're arrested and targeted for doing their jobs. Um, so I'm far from alone in experiencing abuse. But I experienced a very unique type of abuse, which comes with covering this beat, particularly because some of those people who deliberately spread conspiracies or who have been kind of fully indoctrinated by them are extremely reticent to any coverage of this area or attempts to investigate what's really going on. Um, and so um, I get, you know, everything from uh, I hate the BBC, you're a character from 1984 to you're a satanic paedophile that eats babies. And some of it's so weird like that that you, you know, you're, you're, you're so kind of distanced from it. You kind of think like, I'm, I'm very obviously not eating babies <laughs> for the record. Uh, so uh, for, for, for the vast majority of it, you can sort of like dissociate. And I think that's, uh, you know, a, quite an effective coping mechanism. Um, I also think, you know, overwhelmingly, I get so many positive messages from people who uh, like my reporting or feel as though they've benefited from it. And, you know, that in itself is really helpful. Um, the stuff that's harder is when you're kind of sent threats very regularly so i frequently have threats which require kind of uh, security involvement at the bbc M more so particularly in recent months that's kind of escalated as the year has gone on and um, that's not always easy but i think you know I, I think one of the best ways of dealing with it is actually to speak about it because it's really not normal but there's this kind of uh, attitude that like not certainly not by my colleagues and my editors who've been brilliant but i think more broadly that oh you know abuse comes with anything we should we should just be used to it and while you know criticism is always welcome people don't have to like stuff you know that's totally normal you know sending people death threats is really not very really normal <laughs> uh, and so i think speaking about it and having you know a brilliant team and friends and family who are like this is a bit strange that shouldn't be going on it's always helpful yeah of course i mean it's horrible that you have to go through it and it is horrible that it comes with the job and hopefully that will change in the future as people maybe talk up about it a bit more um so another question that i had is more about actually how social media regulates fake news um i read recently that um from 2021 and um, twitter's going to start or uh, yeah start regulating um fake news about vaccines and this is kind of similar to what we've seen with um after the us election with trump's tweets coming out as disputed um, do you think that Twitter and other social media platforms are beginning to do more to regulate this sort of disinformation? 
This year, there's been a real um, increase in measures being taken by social media sites to tackle disinformation, particularly health disinformation um, about coronavirus and now about the vaccine. Um, um, and I think while a lot of the time, you know, action is welcomed by those who are monitoring social media, um, on the whole, the, the criticism tends to be that stuff comes too late. Um, and I think maybe that boils down to a fundamental misunderstanding of how disinformation thrives and spreads because it doesn't tend to be, you know, one mega viral post makes everyone lose it and that's it. It tends to be a gradual drip, drip, drip of conspiracy and uh, false content. Um, and when people keep seeing the same ideas on their social media feeds again and again, it's not that they become totally indoctrinated and think, oh yes, Bill Gates is going to microchip me. Instead, it's that they quite understandably start to think, oh, maybe there's something to this, you know, should I should I be believing this? And they start to ask questions or those seeds of doubt are sown. And obviously it's really important that people ask questions and interrogate things and are interested in things. Um, but it, it's, you know, you want to be interrogating everything and you don't want to be kind of just believing falsehoods and rejecting uh, other kind of verified and trusted information. Um, so I, I think that, and then there are disputes about what you know, the action taken by social media sites and what's effective. So labeling is something that we've seen a lot of, particularly with regards to the US election and a lot of tweets from, from Donald Trump. Um, and while some people think that's helpful for those who are kind of on the edge, who, who might not have believed this stuff, but if they saw it, might begin to say, ooh, and then they'll see a fact check and think, oh, actually, this isn't true. Um, they think it's helpful for those people. It generally isn't helpful for those who already believe it. And some argue actually it pushes them further away from trusted and reliable sources because they begin to kind of think oh the social media sites are against us and it fuels that conspiracy the same with facebook's recently announced it's going to be removing um uh disinformation about the vaccine that contradicts the world health organization and public health officials um which is a really big move from facebook and similar actions been taken by youtube a, a while ago as well um but again for those who really believe these conspiracies it just it can just fuel the fire um and the argument is that that you know should this stuff have been removed in the summer etc etc so uh, you can find kind of critics and analysts across the spectrum who have different views about this but i think the universal opinion would be that social media sites haven't acted uh, quickly and effectively enough on disinformation even though they are now acting do you think that there will ever be a point where that will kind of be satisfactory obviously there's like you said people take in little bits of disinformation from small tweets so will it ever be able to do it on such a large scale that it does remove that disinformation do you think i think disinformation is a really complex problem with a lot of facets and um uh, resolving and tackling it will will kind of require uh, all of those assets and i always like to point out actually because you know at the bbc we're impartial and and we report on stories um and we don't kind of campaign like my job isn't to stop disinformation happening my job is to cover it and investigate it and get to the bottom of it um and there's a huge difference between fact and truth and opinion and sometimes i think because social media is so polarized we think of disinformation as some kind of like opinion debate when harmful false information is just like objectively wrong whether you think it should be there because of free speech is a whole nother argument, but it is just a question of fact and f fact and fiction. Um, and I think when it comes to um, covering, uh, when it comes to kind of res resolving the, the resolution of disinformation, I think, you know, it will be down to circumstance, what's going on in the world. At the moment, a lot of people are really frightened. They're turning social media for answers, again, quite understandably, um, often easier answers to very complex questions um, which can satisfy us and you know give us a bit of comfort really when it's all a bit crazy um, I think that um, people are using social media so much more and so that exacerbates the problem and therefore you know we turn to social media sites to see what they're doing we also see what the government is doing what are the government doing to regulate this uh, there was a hearing last week with a government select committee hearing um, all about this topic asking social media bosses what they're doing but again you know there's a lot of there's a lot of eyes are on the government to see what they're doing here and all over the world um, and when we think about the psychology of conspiracies that's a whole nother issue which won't be resolved just by fact checking and um, for some they feel like you need quite complex de-radicalization programs in order to uh, help people out of 
uh, out of the rabbit hole. Um, so I, I think that, and then we all have our own responsibility as well to think about what we're sharing, to think about who we're sharing it with and to speak to those who might be sharing mistruths and to have constructive conversations. So, you know, it requires action on all those fronts and what will be effective will kind of depend on what's going on in the world at the time and, and how they all connect with one another. Thank you so much. That answered my question in a lot of detail, which is great. Um, so because there's quite a lot of people on this um, call at the moment who are probably young journalists because of the platform that we've created, um, I wondered if you could give any tips to people who might be wanting to go into a similar career to the one that you're in currently. Yeah, um, so uh, there's lots of advice I'd give. Um, I wanted to do, I wanted to be a journalist from when I was really quite little. I used to be obsessed with watching BBC World News on holiday, um, <laughs> which is which is slightly lame, although I was eight years old, so I think it's sort of allowed. Um, and um, I did lots of uh, reporting and journalism when I was at school. Um, so I did this really great young reporter scheme where you got to write an article about stuff going on in your local area, news stories, once a month. And I did that for four years working for my local paper. Um, I studied French and Russian at university, which means I was lucky enough to get to uh, study abroad. And while I was abroad, um, I did reporting in both France and in, and in Moscow, uh, where I was living, uh, which, which was brilliant. Um, I applied for all kinds of different work experience schemes. Um, and uh, I had the opportunity to do some work experience at Private Eye and also at The Guardian, where I then started doing shifts. So it's, I mean, from that perspective, it's about, you know, applying for everything, always putting yourself out there, emailing people, asking questions. You know, if, if it's something you really want to do, then it's really, really worth always talking to people. And, and most people will be really happy to kind of have a conversation with you and give you advice and tips. Um, in terms of kind of the specific role I'm doing now. So I started at the BBC um, and uh, I was doing various shifts at different BBC programs, at Newsnight, at 6 to 10 o'clock news, often at the weekends, learning lots of brilliant stuff. I then started working on more investigative stories at Newsnight, um, looking into the impact of possible no deal Brexit and then looking into social media and it's then that I was connected with the team at BBC Trending who are brilliant and I'd recommend people sort of following and listening to their podcasts um, and from there I then ended up covering the UK election for BBC Trending investigating social media what was going on um, uh, online during that election and the impact it was having on people and it's from there really that this a uh, new role was born that I do, which is the specialist reporter investigating disinformation in social media. And that was with a view to covering the US election, but ended up obviously uh, covering everything coronavirus in between. Um, and I, I think kind of my main bits of advice with regards to, to pursuing kind of uh, a similar career are that, uh, particularly if you're interested in, in broadcast and, and reporting, um, are that always you know, put yourself out there, always email people, always talk to people. There's so many brilliant journalists and uh, people who work at the BBC and elsewhere who've been so helpful to me and I'm incredibly grateful for. I think when you're young, actually um, having a, a, an area of expertise or a niche that you, that you understand and that you really like covering is a good thing. Obviously, you never want to kind of pigeonhole yourself too much, but that is a brilliant way of kind of being able to uh, further your career before you then broaden it out. So kind of being more specific and then going forwards. But obviously, when you first start, you know, you know, any brilliant opportunity, take and give it your best shot and run at it. And then from there, you can sort of develop, uh, develop further. Um, and what else would I say? Um, just that, um, and, and if it's something that you really want to do, like absolutely don't give up. There's no kind of set path or way of getting into journalism. There are all kinds of different ways and all kinds of different schemes, but also, you know, a lot of people don't do schemes. I, I didn't do one and I know lots of other people that don't. And, you know, there's no single kind of blueprint and path, but if it's something that you really want to do, the currency is ideas and being able to do original reporting and, and, and wanting to be there. And all of those things count for a lot. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think that's a good note to leave you with me on and move over to the Q&A. Um, so yeah, as we're going on with the Q&A, please continue to ask questions um, if you come up with any. And yeah, I'm going to pass over to Rachel. Thank you. Uh, so the first question we have is about the live interviews you do. So you're often asked difficult questions. So what are your strategies for answering coherently under pressure? Uh, so when it comes to doing lives, particularly on TV and radio, um, 
I tend to find the most helpful thing is to know what you're talking about, which seems like an obvious thing to say, but actually, you know, always making sure that when it's a particular report I've done myself or when it's something that I know quite a lot about, I generally don't feel nervous at all because I think I understand this, um, you know, I, I get it and I'm able to talk about it. I think that's kind of golden rule number one. Um, I also think it's really helpful to kind of have three key points that you want to make, that you plan to make in your life. Um, and, uh, you know, regardless of what you're asked, you often will be able to make those points. Another thing is working. Um, I often work with the team who are put outputting the different programs. So whether it's, you know, BBC World or Radio 4 or Five Live or whoever it is. And I, I'll often suggest like these, I'll say these are the things I'd really like to talk about, or these are the points I'd really like to make. And so that tends to mean that the questions that are asked are ones that, you know, I know I want to answer, which is, which is a good thing. And, um, but broadly, I, I think that it's always, it's always good to, to, have an idea of kind of clearly what you'd like to say, um, maybe some case studies you can talk about, or if it's a report you've done yourself, then that's quite easy because you've probably spent a lot of time working on it. Um, and it's the sort of thing that that I think seems really scary when you sort of think about it or watch it from afar, but actually when you're the person doing it, doing the reporting in there, in a studio that's usually totally empty apart from a presenter and the crew, it probably feels, it actually feels quite different. Um, uh, but yeah, always I think, it reminds me of if anyone's ever studied languages, it's a bit like, or even at school when you, if you did languages, it's a bit like doing a, an oral examination. Like it's quite similar in the way that you prepare and, and how you'd uh, think about what you're going to say. But yeah, my crucial thing would be never agree to go on air and talk about something that you don't know about. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. Um, another question is about um, finding sources. So how do you go about finding sources or interviews to talk about when you want to humanise the effect of disinformation? So that can vary really. Um, uh, often it involves me kind of investigating specific stories and getting to the bottom of who they affect. So um, when I was looking into the human cost of misinformation, um, I was dig I, I tend to use social media a lot. So I was digging around on Facebook and that's when I came across Brian, uh, who'd done a status about what had happened to him and how he and his wife had both been really ill from coronavirus, having believed it was a hoax. And then I got in touch with him and, and you know, speaking to people who've been um, affected by conspiracies or disinformation can be really, um, uh, you know, I mean, in Brian's case, he was experiencing experiencing something quite difficult. So you have to have these really sensitive conversations and, and you want to win someone's trust. You want them to trust you with their story. Similarly with Patricia, whose feet had became anti-vax propaganda, I tracked her down. I had to add over 100 Patricias on Facebook because her name appears to be one of the most popular in Texas. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you know that's crucial because if I couldn't get to the bottom of what was going on you know I wasn't just going to trust the statement that was given to me by the drug company I needed to figure out what had happened from her from her doctors from you know and that, that's my job to investigate what's going on sometimes people get in touch with me there was a story I did which was about um, uh, an anti-racism protester called Momo uh, and he received awful racist abuse after um, he was falsely accused of setting fire to the Cenotaph, which is in central London, during a Black Lives Matter, the flag at the Cenotaph, uh, during a Black Lives Matter protest uh, in the summer. Um, but it turns out the video that they were sharing of someone doing this wasn't of him. Um, and he actually reached out to me. Um, and similarly, um, I, I quite recently interviewed the son of um, one of the leaders of Britain's conspiracy community. Uh, he also had reached out to me, Sebastian Shemarani. Um, and you know, when people reach out to you, that's, that's a different verification process. Because when you're trying to find someone, you generally know, you know, there's no kind of ulterior motive for someone wanting to speak to you. But when someone gets in touch with you, you always have to kind of interrogate their story, check their intentions, ask why they want to speak to you. And really, you know, investigate what's going on and that works universally but I tend I tend to say that social media is a really good way of finding people particularly uh, parent groups local Facebook groups um, are great ways of finding people impacted by viral disinformation I guess because it's the arena in, in which they're coming across it. So this is sort of similar kind of coming off the back of that but what is your strategy for finding and I guess verifying stories as well when, when you're looking into like how do you double check that it's a legit I mean, story? Yeah, so it sort of depends on what you're double checking. I mean, the fact checkers I work with, you know, will, for instance, come across a dodgy claim on social or, or a claim on social media and they'll speak to um, experts in that field. For instance, if it's about coronavirus, virologists and scientists and various others, they'll look at different bits of research. They'll look at the counter argument or the kind of other research being shown and, and 
get to the bottom of whether it's true or not. And that that's, involves quite complex kind of uh, speaking to different experts and verifying the information in front of you, asking yourself whether it makes sense, whether it adds up, who it's coming from, whether the source is trusted. Um, when it comes to a lot of the reporting I do, um, it often involves talking to a range of different people to figure out what's happened. So that could be, for instance, you know, in the case of Momo, I myself looked at the video being shared um, and and it was very obviously not him and, and tried to get to the bottom of who it actually was. Um, or in the case of Patricia, I spoke to Pfizer um, because she'd uh, taken part in their vaccine trial um, and they said that her injury was unrelated to the trial. Um, I then spoke to her doctors and to her who confirmed that actually she'd received the placebo and that her injury was related to something else. Um, and she explained to me what happened. Um, but often it's about, you know, speaking to a variety of different people and getting to the truth of what's going on. Um, there's also obviously really great verification you can do of, of stuff you're seeing online. So quite a good example was yesterday I was scrolling on TikTok and I saw some videos of people rushing to leave London. There were lots of videos about that. And there was one and I, I thought, this is a bit weird. There's no one wearing any masks. And then if you kind of looked at it for a bit longer, you thought, oh, they're all wearing shorts. And so those kind of open source investigation tools that went, oh, that was probably in the summer and not during the pandemic, uh, are a really helpful way of verifying content on social media. So it just sort of depends on which, which kind of story you're working on. Um, but we always get to the bottom of it and we always verify what we report. I mean, we don't always, but if we don't get to the bottom of it, we don't report it. <laughs> So um, the next question is, how do you ensure you're getting a balanced perspective when you are reading the news, when there is so much information out there that can feel an overwhelming attempt to get a grasp of everything? So how do you make sure that the information you're consuming is legitimate? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I think that it's a lot about kind of like firstly, which sources you can trust. Um, for instance, if you're scrolling on Instagram and you see a post or a video and you think, oh, like, uh, is this true? I'm not sure. Um, I really, there are all kinds of great fact checkers who do really good work. So when it comes to specifically disinformation online, if you search, you know, if you saw something about Bill Gates on, on, uh, Instagram that suggested that I don't know he was trying to deliberately kill people which you know showing some of the clips and and conversations he's had you can maybe see why people seeing these posts might come to those conclusions if you search them you'll often find that Snopes and Full Fact and the BBC have done a lot of work uh, verifying what the video is about and it's not just this is false and move on they actually talk through their workings which I think is really helpful because you yourself can then see oh okay that makes sense I understand what's happened here um, or I understand why this is misleading I think when it comes to news more broadly it's always good to read a variety of different sources but to read trusted sources um, it's always important to remember that uh, whether it's BBC News or whether it's different newspapers or different broadcasters they are held accountable for what they publish by regulators and that doesn't mean they're always right you know journalists are guilty of spreading mistruths as well but it does mean that um, uh, you can trust that on the whole you know they're held more accountable than some random person on Instagram who decides to share a video of Bill Gates um, obviously also you know conversation is very polarized at the moment and a, a lot of what's being said both in the media and online is on a backdrop of uh, political opinion or um, you know what's happening um, and so I think just really thinking about you know which sources you can trust I certainly know I'd rather hear about coronavirus from trusted virologists and vaccinologists and scientists who certainly get it more than I do than I would you know my friend's French friend on Facebook. <laughs> So this next question kind of leads on from that perfectly. Uh, you mentioned that tackling disinformation is much harder with people who are deeply enriched in beliefs about a certain topic. How do you think we can go about getting this like past this barrier and encourage people to think more critically and beyond what they believe is a fact towards what is actually a fact? I think one of the best ways of doing this is actually, um, it's in the article I have out today, but it's encouraging people to be critical, to be skeptical, but to use those skills for good, to use them kind of universally. So actually weaponizing, there's a, there's a really great guy I, I interviewed for that article um, called Phil, and he's from Belfast, and he used to believe a range of conspiracy theories, including about 9-11 and JFK and stuff like that. And he says the thing that helped him out of the rabbit hole was actually, um, realizing that he was not applying his critical thinking and skepticism to the kind of new sources he'd found he was just applying them to official sources and once you start to kind of apply that critical thinking all around you're far more likely to come to an accurate conclusion because you're properly scrutinizing what you see and who you can trust and what you're reading online but i do think a lot of it boils down to trust um and that's a 
that's a big issue. Um, and um, a lot of people are distrustful of the media, including the BBC, for a variety of different reasons. And so I think as reporters and journalists, um, being transparent in our reporting, so being able to show people our workings and how we figured something out and to tell that story is really effective um, and can hopefully help people kind of better understand how we do our jobs. I mean, even talking to you now, hopefully kind of increases people's trust in what we do and, and how we do it. Um, so I think I think those are kind of good ways of trying to combat that in, in the short term. So um, the next question is for a bit of advice. Um, someone is trying to investigate sexual assaults at university. Which advice would you give on tackling an issue such as this in reporting? So it's not a specific topic I've covered before, and obviously I can imagine it's a really uh, sensitive one. Um, if it were me kind of starting from scratch on that story, um, obviously I'd talk to the different people affected, which I'm sure the person is doing at the moment, um, and people who might have come forward to talk about it or um, who've been impacted. Um, putting in FOIs with universities can be good um, in terms of understanding kind of complaints processes, but obviously there's quite, uh, there are quite strict privacy rules. I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so this is me just kind of presuming that that will be the case. Um, obviously, if um, somebody makes specific allegations about something that happened to them at university, um, then once you've kind of stood up that story and worked out what happened and um, uh, then you have to kind of turn to different people for rights of replies, both legally and editorially. And um, you obviously have a duty of care to the people that you're, um, the people that you're, uh, reporting on so often at the BBC we will uh, change people's names for their privacy or, or we'll leave out their surname or we'll be light on detail but I mean particularly with the topic of sexual assault um, but there are lots of really I have lots of really good colleagues at the BBC who um, do quite a lot on these kinds of sensitive investigations um, so um, um, Mega Mohan's really good on kind of covering this kind of topic um, or um, Rihanna as well has done quite a lot uh, Rihanna Croxford's done quite a lot on universities um, and uh, and dealing with kind of like criticism of universities and their different policies so it's worth giving them a follow um, if you can but yeah um, I mean always approach these things by you know speaking to people by working out who you need to write a reply you know who you need to go for for more to go for for more information and working it through in quite a methodical way. Um, thank you very much so we have someone asking that they admire the work that you're doing to counter misinformation and it must be very difficult to remain cool and calm in the face of so much blatant misinformation particularly when targeted personally with threats of violence. Do you ever personally take a break from social media, especially for the sake of your mental health? I mean, the answer to that question is I should. <laughs> um, um, I do occasionally try to. I'm not always very <laughs> good at doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm technically uh, meant to be off now. Uh, um, but obviously with all the news going on, it is, it is really hard to switch off. And I do think it's, it's really important that we do do that. And particularly when you spe spend a lot of time with your head in this kind of um, sphere. And it's a topic that I'm really passionate about and interested in. So I kind of want to read about it and want to know what's going on. I'm also working on a big investigation into uh, the anti-vax movement and its impact on the hesitant and stuff like that. So you kind of have like different things ticking along in the background that make it again hard to switch off. Um, but I, I do think that you know, it's, it, I think it's the same for anyone reporting on coronavirus, but, you know, specifically reporting on viral disinformation and conspiracies, you know, it impacts, it, it impacts you as well as the world. And you kind of forget that you are a piece in the puzzle, that you are part of it, even though as a reporter, it's your job not to be a part of it, it's your job to cover it. But we're all experiencing the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are coming across viral mistruths on social media or have friends and family who are affected or, um, uh, know of people who've been really negatively impacted by this kind of thing. Uh, so uh, it's a very unique time at the moment to be a reporter because you find yourself both living the story and covering it. Yeah, and thank you very much. So we have someone asking if you have any specific tips on networking and using social media to meet new people such as other journalists, for example Twitter and LinkedIn, and do you think it's worthwhile trying to get a mentor in the journalism industry? I think it's really good to have a mentor. Actually, that would have been one of my first things to say. Um, I've worked with some, I, I, I've had the fortune of kind of working with some really brilliant uh, journalists who have given me invaluable advice. I think that one of the most effective things and something that I, I, I did when I first started at the BBC and have done is emailing people that you admire and, you know, not asking them for a job or 
you know, they're not the kind of people who'd be able to do that, but asking them for advice and saying, I'm really interested in this. Um, I love doing this. This is the experience I have. I just wondered if you have any advice at all. I mean, obviously right now it's a really hard time to be getting into journalism. It's, it's hard enough at the best of times, but it's even harder um, if you're, uh, if it's happening in a pandemic. Um, so I think reaching out to different people, whether it's, you know, people who've recently joined, I'm always happy to answer people's questions. Um, I'm, I'm Apologies if I'm quite slow at replying, but if people want to message me, they can. Um, there are all kinds of uh, um, journalists at the BBC, including, you know, really famous busy people who will be really helpful. Uh, for me personally, like Emily, Emily Maitlis has been absolutely brilliant at, you know, uh, always giving me really good guidance and uh, was really helpful when I first joined the BBC um, and continues to be. So um, I think having those kind of unofficial mentors, people you admire and who'll give you advice is a really, really helpful thing to have. And that doesn't matter who it is. Um, and um, uh, it's so heartening to always see how willing a lot of particularly very successful people are um, to help out those trying to get into the industry, particularly because they often remember what it was like and how difficult it can be. Um, and if you're someone who's really passionate about it and uh, a really good journalist and reporter, people want you to be able to, you know, be a journalist. So um, I think always pitching ideas as well is a really, really good thing to do because the currency is ideas. There are lots of people who would like to be journalists and um, I'm sure would be really great ones, but actually being able to say, here's my idea. I've got, you know, these three kind of uh, reports I'd really like to do that I think would be really impactful. Uh, here's different people I've spoken to. Actually, you know, having those ideas ready made is really effective. And whether you pitch them freelance or whether you kind of use them as a way of pitching to a specific editor or output editor, um, I think that's uh, a really good thing to do. Um, so those would be my top tips. I think Twitter's a really good thing uh, and it's a very good place to, um, I think it's a really good thing in some ways uh, and it's a really good place to get in touch with people but I think sometimes we can lose perspective that kind of a lot of journalists spend a lot of their time all talking on Twitter and I don't think that's a particularly good thing you know our job is to report uh, on what's going on and the people that we serve particularly at the BBC is our audience and our audience tends not to be on Twitter so much it tends to be everywhere else although you know it's great to have people on Twitter who are interested in this stuff and um, so I think reaching out to other journalists that you admire or you think uh, are covering an area that you'd be interested in uh, on Twitter and also by email is, is a really good way of getting started and don't be disheartened if people don't reply to you they're often just really busy um but you know it's worth emailing lots of people also don't be embarrassed i often talk to people who are like oh i really don't want to send an email because i don't want to seem like that weird kind of loser person who no one replies to that absolutely is not something you should worry about um always email if you're polite and nice and courteous uh, and interested and want to do it then you know i would never take any offense in receiving a message or an email from someone with that kind of attitude uh, so you know never be embarrassed to reach out to people and and also to show off to a point i think it's a very british thing and often a very female thing uh, to not be like oh I've done this and I'm really happy about it uh, and I think people should say oh yeah I did this and this and this and I'm uh, you know here was its impact and I really like doing this you should be proud of all those things without being kind of arrogant and awful it's quite easy to be like yes I, I I'm proud of this and I like it and please have a read thank you very much so um, you mentioned that you studied languages and you did some time abroad do you think this comes in handy at all when you're doing your work and do you have any tips for someone who wants to learn a language? Uh, yes, I find having so studying languages was very, very helpful um, in general uh, for my career. Um, I think that the good thing about studying languages is that it offers you a kind of unique ability that someone who doesn't, you know, everyone's the same, but if you're able to speak a language, then that's a really great skill to have. Um, when I was on my year abroad, I used my languages a lot for my reporting. I worked at a local newspaper in France. I also worked at a big, uh, a bigger news site in Paris. Um, and when I was in Russia, I did some um, news reports for the Moscow Times and then um, a bit of reporting for The Guardian on the subject of um, women's rights in Russia, so domestic abuse and other things. Um, and I found my language is really helpful for that. Um, at the moment, I find my language is really helpful for, you know, messaging different people uh, where disinformation is spread in other countries and understanding what's being shared. Um, I find it really helpful with regards to foreign interference, which obviously is something we talk about a lot and we talk about Russia a lot. And I think having an understanding of not just a language, but a different culture and a different people and how a country works is really helpful. And that's something that comes with learning a language or living in a different place. And so I found that really helpful for covering the topic of foreign influence um, and that kind of thing. Um, I think in terms of learning a language, um, particularly if you're learning a new alphabet, it uh, requires a lot of time and effort, but it's, you know, 
really rewarding and a brilliant thing to do. There are all kinds of different, you know, online programs, apps, uh, courses that you can do. Um, and I think that if there's a particular language you're passionate about, there's no loss in learning it. And I think more broadly, the skills that come with learning a language, which is, you know, talking to people, communicating with different people, um, uh, uh, trying to, you know, understand something that's quite foreign to you, that's totally different to, to you or the culture maybe that you grew up in. Um, and, um, you know, I think those are all skills that serve you very well as a journalist. Um, often they're quite, it's quite logical and mathematical as well as kind of like uh, historical and literary and you can read all kinds of different things. Uh, so uh, I'm a big language advocate because I'm not enough people <laughs> study languages. Um, I always think learning Russian was one of the hardest things. I, I did French and Russian and learning Russian was one of the hardest things I ever do. So whenever people send me emails saying I'm a satanic pedophile, I'm like, easier than learning Russian though. So. <laughs> <laughs> So our next question is, do you think this information and this information has more of an impact on young people as social media is on the rise? For example, if it's your first time voting in an election, you're surrounded by false views on social media. I think that's a really good question um, because people tend to think of older people as being impacted by disinformation because on the whole, um, they often are less social media literate, um, just in so much as they didn't grow up with social media in the way that young people have. But the flip side of that is actually young people spend a lot of time on social media far more often than some older people. And they also uh, consume their news in a very different way. Um, it really struck me that last week, I, I was interviewing an 82 year old lady um, who had come across um, a really scary anti-vax video online which promoted totally false claims about uh, the coronavirus vaccine suggesting for instance that um, it's part of some genocidal plot um, or that it will alter your DNA which are, which are false claims and it really really scared her and she got in touch with me and she said oh I, I've seen this video and now I think I maybe don't want to have the vaccine I'm really frightened and I went to interview her for this investigation I'm doing um, and what struck me was that her husband who is 84 had totally rejected this video he was like this is fake news I know this is fake news um, and and she you know has now come around to come to the conclusion that the information was not false and that it shouldn't be trusted and they both tend to get their news from linear output so they watch the tv they listen to the radio they don't really use the internet at all they've been sent that link which meant that they were vulnerable to believing it because they don't see it very much but actually that they tend to turn to more trusted sources and consume their news in a more traditional way whereas with younger people i've seen um, promoting similar kinds of claims on social media. Often Instagram is their first port of call and they do trust, uh, you know, celebrity influencers more than they do mainstream media. It just hasn't been part of how they consume information. So I think they're totally mistaken to believe young people are not affected by this. I was outside Topshop filming a piece to camera for a report I was doing, um, which is where you like talk to the camera. And um, there were two blokes in their late twenties who started uh, shouting at me about uh, Bill Gates uh, trying to kill everyone with a vaccine and coronavirus being a hoax um, and we had this conversation and it quickly emerged to me that they actually were just very critical of the government which is completely fine and obviously they were really entitled to express but they were turning to conspiracies to sort of quell that concern and that was because of what they were seeing on social media and um, so I think the crucial thing is is that when people are exposed to stuff on social media no matter what their age if they have kind of you know legitimate fears and concerns or legitimate criticisms they can be perhaps more susceptible to the impact of that disinformation and that doesn't matter how old you are um which is why social media literacy it, i think is a really useful thing and i often do reports for bbc news round um, and for bite size about how kids can spot fake news because if that just becomes part of how we all process what we're seeing online i think that would be a good thing so well, again this question kind of comes off that last one how much do you think new platforms such as tiktok and other social media outlets are impacting journalism as a whole Um, I think they are impacting journalism an awful lot, um, particularly because it's all about how people consume their news and passive consumption is such a thing, which is uh, how people consume their news by scrolling through Instagram or TikTok or however. And, you know, you see a picture of your friend's cat and you see a picture of someone by their Christmas tree and then you see a post about Bill Gates. Like all these things are kind of merged together in one space. And it's the same on TikTok. You might see kind of funny stuff mixed with uh serious kind of political criticism mixed with satire mixed with everything else um and i think that we are becoming used to consuming our news in that very quick way where you know we're probably all a bit more impatient than we used to be and we expect to be able to immediately um understand what's going on and i think as journalists and reporters we we can use that to our benefit in so much as we want to share our stories 
in that kind of medium because people will be more receptive to it which is why i also think that you know with reporting where we show we, like, it doesn't have to be kind of quick and slapdash and whatever obviously that's bad journalism and shouldn't happen like that but using those particular formats i know newsround to try really hard to kind of to use kind of TikTok style stuff on their videos because they know it will, you know, it's more natural and more appealing to the audience that, that they have. Um, but also we often find that really in-depth reporting and investigative stories where we tell a story, where we get to the bottom of something and we take them with us and people are their own investigators are really popular with young audiences too. And I think people shouldn't underestimate, oh, young people just don't care. They kind of just want to scroll on TikTok, whatever they do. You know, they, young people want high quality investigative reporting, but they want it in a way that is appealed to them, that is natural to them. And that will be very different to the 84 year old who I was talking about earlier, uh, who consumes news differently. Um, so I think we should uh, always try and weaponize that for good. And I think the media industry is, is obviously that's a big challenge going forward for the next few years. So the next question is about misinformation and misinformation. If you had Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey in a room, what would your advice be to them about managing dis disinformation and misinformation on their social media platforms? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure whether I'm even allowed to answer that. Uh, I would, uh, if I was, I guess if I was kind of, if I was questioning them, um, um, I, I would in my questioning highlight two things. Uh, one is that Disinformation is highly complex, um, which they already know, um, but therefore that it requires a very complex and nuanced approach. Um, and a lot of a lot of conspiracies and disinformation um, come from kind of a small number of very big groups or people who are deliberately spreading this stuff. And it's from there that they reach people who are perhaps vulnerable to it, but are not the kind of initial perpetrators. And I think if you look at that ecosystem, it's quite easy to see how if you were to shut off those bad actors you may see a stem in the flow of disinformation but obviously you know for social media sites it's this constant juggle between the issue of free speech and the issue of harmful disinformation and i always think it's interesting if you look at attitudes in the uk on the whole people are pro uh, harmful misinformation being removed uh, and you know are less worried about the free speech issue when it comes to stuff that's explicitly false whereas in the us which is obviously where all of these companies are based the free speech issue is massively popular for the vast majority of people and they actually care more about that than they do about the impact of the harmful disinformation often um, so I think it's really interesting to see the differing approaches of different countries around the world to this um, and you know that issue of censorship versus disinformation will be one that rumbles on for a significant period of time and that could could depend on kind of who's in power or who ends up regulating different elements of social media sites and what different countries do um, I guess my emphasis would be on the complexity of disinformation online, uh, how it's evolving so quickly uh, and how conspiracies are increasingly popular and how we don't just need to focus on foreign influence, which is obviously a problem, but actually domestic disinformation, which is far more of a problem or appears to have been during the pandemic and uh, uh, during the election, even though we have seen um, disinformation from foreign actors, whether it's from Russia or Iran or China, um, they tend to have been less impactful. Um, and I think just talking about the people who've been impacted, when I interviewed one of Facebook's bosses a while ago, I brought up the issue of Brian who'd lost his wife. And, you know, talking about the duty of care that these social media sites have or don't have to those using the sites. I think putting a human face on this stuff is not only effective for telling these stories, but probably is quite emotive when it comes to changing policy and it's not my job to change policy but if my reporting does then it does um and um uh it's just interesting i think to always you know bring up everyone can seem like faceless users and you know these social media sites are companies but there are real people on the end of their phones and computers whose lives have been harmed and destroyed by disinformation whether it's sebastian shemarani i mentioned who no longer has a relationship with his mum, uh, he says or uh, Brian's who's what he lost his wife or a lady called Candy I interviewed who never wants to vote in a US election again because she believed viral videos that made false claims about voter fraud so I think revealing those people is effective um, thank you very much for that um, answer so following on something that we mentioned previously it was about mistrust in the media and journalists do you think there is a way that the media can build trust and if so what is the best way to go about it um, I think that I, I think that mistrust is a really big problem, and it certainly is when it comes to dis disinformation. I think there are various things we can do. I think we can, um, 
you know, the fewer mistakes that journalists make, the better that is for trust. And mistakes are usually made when people are uh, under pressure or stressed or uh, trying to be there first. And being there first isn't always the best thing. You want to be there right and get and get it right. Um, and so I think that Twitter hasn't really helped with that because often people people are kind of quick, understandably, to want to share news, but it's good to, you know, and that is now uh, one of the BBC's new guidelines that you have to really think carefully uh, uh, before you share something online. And when you do, you should always make sure if it's breaking news that, you know, it comes from the BBC News app or website first. I think that's a really good thing. Um, I also think that uh, people um, uh, showing their workings and showing how, you know, in-depth reporting that reveals the anatomy of how something spreads or I mean this is particularly with regards to disinformation but I think it applies across the board um, is really effective I think showing different people whose lives have been affected and um, uh, you know engaging with them and their stories is effective because not only do they build up a relationship of trust with you but I think that kind of outwardly uh, builds up a relationship of trust with with the public um, I think all of those things are really effective obviously you know it's a it's a it, it's a really big issue that's not just resolved by, uh, you know, one quick fix. But I think over time, uh, if those things are championed, particularly in the age of social media, I think that would be a very good thing. Yeah, um, another thing that is going off something we said earlier, you mentioned that having new ideas is very important. How do you go about getting inspiration for new ideas? Um, I think that, I mean, it, it's the sort of thing where it, I, ideas are absolutely the kind of the key I always think um, I think you need to think about I mean firstly what interests you and what topics and areas you're you're interested in but you know you want to tell a really good story uh, and an important story and you need to think about you know often um, for me personally it will involve you know, sort of scrolling through social media and noticing uh, what different people are talking about or noticing uh, um, different people you know stories of different people who've been impacted I feel like you're sort of like once you're on the ideas treadmill ideas just sort of keep coming it's like getting on the sort of getting on the conveyor belt that's the hard bit but for me personally i almost don't have to like i i can't remember the last time i had a day where i sat down and was like right i'm going to sort of come up with an idea because like once you start going you know ideas just come and come and come and you often have a winning formula for how to how to do the reporting on the area that you want. Um, but I think, yeah, just thinking about what interests you, thinking about people impacted, if you can tell the story of how someone's life has been impacted or changed or um, humanize the impact of something going on, um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, I think that, um, you know, I this actually was, when I worked at the local paper, this is when I was, age between 14 and 18 every month you had to come up with something which when you're at school is actually quite hard <laughs> um, and you're kind of sitting there like oh my gosh I don't know what's going on in my local like, there's not very much going on it's a bit boring uh, and um, I remember I did a story all about how doctors at my local hospital were having to pay for parking you know stuff like that like when there's an issue that strikes at, that stands out to you cover it speak to different people think oh um, you know when there's a there's a campaign going on kind of get to the bottom of what's happened um, and I think particularly as young journalists who are very social media literate uh, social media is just a brilliant place to be able to get stories and you can message all kinds of different people and uh, you know uh, and tell really compelling stories whether it's about disinformation and conspiracies or whether it's about abuse or whether it's just about you know different trends going on um, I always think that a story that focuses on a particular person and particular case study is really effective so to say you know I don't know, I was talking to a, a journalist the other day who asked me this very question and she told me how she was really interested in, um, she was really interested in domestic abuse in Italy. Uh, and we were talking about covering that topic and she said to me, well, there are these really good WhatsApp groups where people have been getting help. And you know, you can kind of envisage the report, which would be something like uh, the WhatsApp group that saved my life or, you know, that kind of thing. I think those, you know, thinking about stuff in that way, I have a brilliant editor who's very good at getting you kind of trained into thinking of like you know what's the story i can tell here and don't try and kind of over trying to do too much is not good doing one story brilliantly is really good and i mean i kind of do a mixture of both because i do breaking news and i do kind of in-depth reporting and breaking news is just you know breaking news isn't ideas breaking news is covering what's going on but i think when it comes to uh, particularly when you're young having those those uh, original ideas is 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 vital and um yeah always messaging different people and just trying to get to the bottom of what's going on Perfect. Well, um, it's one o'clock now, but we have a few more questions to ask. So just two more. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I'm on. I'm on leave, so it's fine. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs>
So <laughs> what are your thoughts on Parlet, the social media site that champions itself on being completely unbiased? So Parl has become um, increasingly popular after the US election and this year in general. Um, it's quite similar to some, something called Gab, which people may or may not have heard of. And there are platforms like MeWe um, and Telegram is used quite a lot as well. Um, I think they're interesting, um, but I think one thing we tend to notice is that people find them, people rush to join them and then find them less interesting because there's not really much room for debate because everyone on the platform agrees with them. And so the kind of... Uh, joy i guess inverted commas that's derived from using social media is 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 lost in those spaces and so we tend to find that they don't kind of take off in a huge way like most people on this call probably haven't heard of gab and that is telling because a similar thing kind of happened uh, a few years ago in 2016 um, and the same story sort of recurs again and again um, but nonetheless it does raise kind of those big questions again about censorship and about uh, false information and how you tackle disinformation and conspiracies online. Conspiracies in particular are very hard to tackle because they tend to be hard to disprove. Um, all you can say is there's no evidence to support this or it just doesn't really make any sense, but it's much harder to kind of come up with factual evidence to disprove them. And that's the nature of how a conspiracy theory works. Uh, and so I think for that reason, that's a real difficulty for social media sites and you can kind of see why people who feel like social media sites are kind of against them or blocking them might turn to these spaces. But I sort of don't expect them to be, you know, I think that the big dogs will continue to be the big dogs, which is the Facebooks, the Instagrams. Um, we don't, things like Telegram and Parler are much more interesting from the point of view of how people organize themselves. So after the election, we saw these big Stop the Steal Facebook groups um, pop up. And a lot of the Stop the Steal protesters would again organize themselves on uh, you know, Telegram, or I've been attending some anti-lockdown protests, which while I'm sure there are people there with legitimate concerns often also feature people uh, promoting false claims and conspiracies. Um, and they often organize themselves on Telegram channels. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of kind of seeing how different movements coordinate. Um, but I don't think it will be the main social media sites used kind of for the coming months or years. Okay, perfect. And the final question we've got is if you have any book on the subject of um, conspiracy theories that you would recommend for anyone looking to get into this sort of thing, or if there's any outlets of information that you would recommend. Um, there are all sorts of really good books. Um, Peter Pomerantsev is really, really good. Uh, he has a brilliant book called, which I've completely forgotten the name of, give me one second, um, which is all about kind of foreign interference and um, uh, disinformation. Uh, one second. Um, which is called uh, This Is Not Propaganda. Um, that's really, really good. Um, the other book uh, that I really like is um, Adventures in the War Against Reality is also very good, which is by Peter Pomerantsev. Um, and uh, there's another really good one that I like, um, and I've, again, forgotten the name of. Um, boom, boom which is uh, How to Lose the Information War, um, which is by Nina Yankovic, who's really nice um, and is really in interesting. Um, and there's also uh, as someone I interviewed for the article I wrote today, a guy called Mick West has written uh, a really interesting book that's about how you can get out of the rabbit hole, um, which is fascinating, which is all about, um, uh, it's, getting, it's something like getting out of the rabbit hole with facts or something along those lines. Um, and that's really interesting on conspiracy theories. Uh, my editor, uh, Mike Wendling, who is the best editor in the world, uh, he's definitely not on this call, um, <laughs> is, uh, has written a brilliant book about QAnon called From QAnon to the White House, all about disinformation and conspiracies in 2016 after the election. That's a really good read. I'm sure he'll be happy that I plugged it. And then uh, the other books I think are really good, not from disinformation, but from a kind of journalism perspective, are um, uh, Michelle Hussein's book, The Skills, is really, really good um, with tips about becoming a journalist. Um, I really like Emily Mavis's book, Airhead, which is brilliant to read. Um, and um, Jeremy Paxman's book, um, I think it's called Asking Questions, is also really good. I like, I like that one. Um, so yeah, those would be my recommendations. I probably missed something really good that I like, but. <laughs> well, uh, that's all for our questions today. So I just want to say thank you to all the attendees for the great questions and thank you for answering all our queries. And I'm going to pass back over to Megan just to wrap things up. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. And yeah, thank you so much for watching my It was really, really interesting. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, so just to say about from us kind of from empowered journalism that in the new year we're hoping to have a couple more workshops um so if you keep an eye out on our social media um 
platforms and power journalism then we'll be advertising about them soon and um, we're also going to send out a survey to all of the participants about the workshop so if you can it'd be great if you could fill them in just so we can have a bit of advice on um, how to improve for the next workshops and obviously follow Mariana Spring on all of our social medias as well because if you don't already I mean that's the main reason that I wanted to host this workshop I found her on Twitter and then found her really interesting so definitely give her a follow um, and yeah thank you so much for joining I think that's all from us and there are some really great questions there so thank you um, thanks for having me and thanks for all the really good questions which made me really think because yeah this is great there are so many questions you could ask <laughs> so long. well I think you answered them all really well so thank you so much um, but yeah that's all from us